Today we have this really nice Infinite Series expansion. And the result is pretty surprising and the solution development is quite elegant. So to start off, we're going to call our series S so we have something to refer to. And I'm going to perform a factorization of the denominator 1 plus n squared in the complex realm. So this gives me the sum over the non-negative integers n of 1 by... Now n squared plus 1 can be factorized in the complex realm as n plus i times n minus i, where i is of course the imaginary unit, that is the square root of negative 1. Now I'm going to need to perform a partial fraction decomposition here. So this gives me the sum over the non-negative integers, integers n of, um, let's write this as n minus i here and plus i there. A negative sign in between, yeah, that should work, 1 and 1 as the uh, numerators. And I'm going to need a factor of 1 by 2i to balance things out. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And because this 1 by 2i term is independent of the uh, index variable n, we can take it out of the summation operator. So we have s being equal to 1 by 2i times the sum over the non-negative integers n of 1 by n minus i minus 1 by n plus i. For the purpose of our solution development, I'm going to perform a transformation for the index variable by letting n equal k minus 1. So this implies that s equals 1 by 2i times the sum over the positive integers k now of 1 by k minus 1 minus i minus 1 by k minus 1 plus i. And next up I'm going to add a 0. And by adding a 0 I mean add a 1 by k minus 1 by k term. So this will give me the following structure. I'll, I'll have s be equal to 1 by 2i times the sum over the positive integers k of 1 by k minus this 1 by k plus i minus 1 term minus 1 by k plus 1 by k minus i minus 1. And now using the linearity of the summation operator, I can write this as 1 by 2i times the sum over the positive integers k of, oh, sorry about that, of 1 by k minus 1 by k plus 1 uh, i minus 1 minus the sum over the positive integers again of 1 by k minus 1 by k minus i minus 1. Now you might be thinking, what the hell was that about? Well, the structures that I have in front of me are closely related to the infinite series representation of the digamma function, whereby we know that digamma z plus 1 equals negative euler masseroni constant plus the sum over the positive integers k of 1 by k minus 1 by k plus z. So on close inspection, I see that if I plug in z equal to i minus 1, then I'll have digamma i minus 1 plus 1 is just i, equal to negative Euler Maseroni constant plus the sum over the uh, wait a second wait a second sorry about that this was the sum over the positive integers sorry that was quite silly of me uh, the sum over the positive integers k of 1 by k minus 1 by k plus i minus 1 so that means one of our infinite series actually just equals digamma i plus the Euler Mascheroni constant. And by a similar token, if you plug in z equal to, let's see, you should plug in z equal to minus i minus 1. So if z equals minus i minus 1, this implies that digamma negative i equals negative Euler Mascheroni constant plus the sum over the positive integers k of 1 by k minus 1 by k minus 1 minus i. Sorry for the bloopers. I'm a bit under the weather. Yeah, I caught the flu. So yeah, that's making it a bit harder for me to keep track of the math. <laughs> anyway, so... We have our uh, series expansions expressed in terms of digamma functions. 
So this implies that S equals 1 by 2i times di gamma i plus order mascaroni constant minus di gamma negative i minus the order mascaroni constant. So these two cancel out quite nicely and we have 1 by 2i times di gamma i minus di gamma negative i and now for the application of some wonderful properties of the di gamma function. First up, we're going to make use of the recurrence relation for the di gamma function, which states that di gamma z plus 1, sorry about that, yeah, much better, equals di gamma z plus 1 by z. And the proof is really elegant. All you need to do is take the recurrence relation for the gamma function, which states that gamma z plus 1 equals uh, z times gamma z, and differentiate with respect to gamma, uh, with respect to z, of course. And this implies that gamma prime z plus 1 equals gamma z plus z times gamma prime z. And we know that the di gamma function is defined as the derivative of the gamma function divided by the gamma function itself. So this implies that gamma prime z, that is a horrible hook there for the gamma. Yeah, much better. Uh, gamma prime z equals gamma z times psi z. So this here implies that psi z plus 1 times gamma z plus 1 here on the left hand side equals uh, gamma z again plus z times di gamma z times uh, gamma z. And if you divide both sides by gamma z plus 1, which we know here is z times gamma z, then you have a very nice result indeed that after the cancellations, uh, here we go, after the cancellations, we have psi z plus 1 being equal to psi z plus 1 by z. So making use of this relation, if I plug in z being equal to negative i, then I have psi of negative i plus 1 or 1 minus i as a better presentation uh, equals di gamma negative i plus 1 by negative i, which implies that psi negative i equals psi 1 minus i minus uh, plus 1 by i, that is, and one of the coolest things about complex analysis is the reciprocal of the imaginary unit equals its additive inverse. This is absolutely awesome. Um, I mean, it's a little thing here in complex analysis that I absolutely love. So making use of this relation and re recalling that S equaled 1 by 2i times di gamma i minus di gamma negative i, it was, yes indeed. So replacing di gamma negative i with uh, this expansion on the right hand side, we have di gamma 1 minus i plus i. Now another property of the di gamma function we're going to make use of here is uh, di gamma 1 minus z minus gamma z being equal to pi times the cotangent of pi times z. A corresponding reflection formula for the di gamma function. Because it's derived using the reflection formula for the gamma function, which states that gamma z times gamma 1 minus z equals pi times the cosecant of pi times z. So this implies on differentiation with respect to z that is, we have gamma prime z times gamma 1 minus z minus gamma z times gamma prime 1 minus z where the negative sign is because of the chain rule uh, on differentiating 1 minus z with respect to z, giving you negative 1, of course. And this equals negative pi times the derivative of the cosecant function is cosecant times cotangent. And of course, because of the chain rule again, we're going to need another factor of pi. So you have pi squared times all of this junk. And once again, making use of the definition of the, the di gamma function and its relationship to the derivative of the gamma function, we have psi z times gamma z times gamma 1 minus z 
minus gamma z times gamma 1 minus z times psi 1 minus z all equal to pi, negative pi squared times cosecant pi z times cotangent pi z. And of course, we can factor out this gamma z uh, times gamma 1 minus z term. And, oh wait, this is it. And we know that this here equals pi times the cosecant of pi times z. So factoring out and canceling it gives you uh, di gamma z minus di gamma 1 minus z being equal to negative, uh, the cosecant cancels out, and so does one of the pi's. So you're left with negative pi times the cotangent, sorry about that, uh, cotangent of pi times z. And of course, you can just flip the order here and write this more nicely as di gamma 1 minus z minus di gamma z being equal to pi times the cotangent of pi times z. <laughs> Now recall that what you had was the sum s being equal to 1 by 2i uh, times di gamma i minus di gamma 1 minus i plus i. So we can write all of this as negative of this pi times the cotangent thingy. So we have negative pi times cotangent pi times z here being equal to i. So we have cotangent i pi okay cool plus the imaginary unit i again and multiplying out this factor of 1 by 2 i finally gives us negative pi times the cotangent cotangent of i times pi divided by 2 i plus 1 by 2 and we know that the cotangent of i times z equals negative i times the hyperbolic cotangent of z so this implies that s equals pi times i times the hyperbolic cotangent of pi divided by 2i plus 1 by 2. And the i's cancel out quite nicely here, giving us the very neat result that the sum over the non-negative integers n of 1 by n squared plus 1 equals pi times the hyperbolic cotangent of pi plus 1 divided by 2. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure, be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.